Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Estrogen Genomics Assessment and Potential Therapeutics. This, today's webinar is hosted by Dr. Robert Boyd, ND, CNS. Um, he's part of our um, medical advisory board. Um, Dr. Boyd, just to give you an introduction here, Dr. Boyd is a naturopathic physician and certified nutrition specialist professional specializing in thyroid disorders, autoimmune disease, infertility, and men's health. He has spent years studying the fields of nutrigenomics as well as the gut microbiome and tailors many of his treatment approaches around these fascinating fields. Dr. Boyd graduated from the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine and he completed residency at the Center of Excellence in the Generative Medicine under the tutelage of Dr. Peter Diadamo, creator of Opus 23. He has co-founded the Terrain Clinic, LLC, with locations in both Alexandria, Virginia and Washington, DC. He also holds an adjunct professor position teaching nutrition at Trinity Washington University. Dr. Boyd, glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, and chat with everyone about estrogenomics and some potential therapeutics and how to really assess this. Um, this is an area that we frequently use um, in our practice here in Alexandria and in Washington, D.C., and we're, I'm really excited to share this information today because I feel like it's been extremely helpful uh, with a lot of our clients and, and getting people answers when they're wanting sort of this DNA information sort of looked at. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started here. So just to kind of outline what we're gonna talk about today, um, we'll, we'll start with talking about the context of using genomics and care and, and how that sort of fits into everything else. Uh, we'll talk about common conditions that are uh, commonly affected by estrogen genomics and where we can sort of insert this piece of the puzzle. Um, the different aspects of estrogen genomics, so the production of estrogens, the metabolism and detoxification of those, and then how the receptor function can affect those things. Um, and then lastly, we'll go through how to use Opus 23 Explorer uh, to actually analyze and interpret this information and then provide an actual client report for your patients uh, so that they can get, get a better understanding of these things and come to you for these answers. So just, just to kind of, um, you know, pull things back a little bit in terms of the context of genomics. Um, I always say when, when I'm talking about this with other doctors or, or working with clients is that this is just one piece of the puzzle. And so, you, you know, it's, it's not a magical crystal ball, but it is a very important piece. Um, and it's, it's a piece that we can really use in the context of uh, giving people answers around this genetic info. And so you always want to consider you know, the patient's chief complaint, their personal medical history, their family history, social history, um, how their current diet and lifestyle, you know, those fundamental things are affecting um, their outcomes, um, lab findings, and then current medications and supplements. <clears throat> and what I really find to be particularly helpful is, is that lab finding section. So when you can, whenever you can get sort of a in-depth look from a functional lab perspective from somewhere like Dutch that does uh, comprehensive functional hormones and then pair it with this genomic information to see where th where the pathways are lining up and, and where things are diverging. Um, it really gives you some incredible insights. And so you can kind of get an, a look at what's going on currently with them and then what, what they were set up for, um, you know, from the time of conception. And so I, I love tying those things in together and it's, and it's always important with all of these things to consider. Um, that, that you want to look at the genomic information through the context of those as well. So what are some common conditions that are affected by um, estrogen genomics? And so, you know, we commonly always, always think of estrogen as a female hormone, but it also has a lot of interplay with, with male uh, hormones as well. Um, and for the purposes of our presentation today, we're mainly gonna focus on sort of the female aspect, aspects of that. Um, but I just wanted to tie in here at the start that there's also conditions uh, with men that are affected by these things. Uh, so with females, we're commonly seeing that estrogen genomics uh, have a big play in PCOS, uh, breast and ovarian cancer, particularly the ones that are estrogen sensitive, uh, irregular menses, endometriosis, osteoporosis, infertility, all of these hormonal related conditions where um, you can start to tie in where there might've been some uh, genomic hiccups along the way. And then on the male side, we see commonly with the prostate, 
um, BPH, prostate cancer, uh, infertility, and then low testosterone as well. So you can get answers for both of these clients, uh, you know, for, for both genders um, when it comes to the genomics. And, and so it's important to, to always keep that in context too. So this map that you see over to the right, um, this is where we're going to mainly spend a lot of our time today. Um, we're going to go through every aspect of this map and all of the different sort of areas that become uh, important when we're when we're looking at the genomics, and we'll break it down in terms of uh, where we go along the pathways. So starting out with things like the actual production of est estrogen, uh, whether it's estradiol or estrone, um, coming from testosterone and androstenedione. Uh, then we'll go further down the pathway and look at metabolism and detoxification of those estrogens. So whether or not we're looking at the cytochrome P450 pathways, um, which in particular of those enzymes are important. And then we'll also look at methylation, sulfation, glucuronidation, um, all of these other uh, phases of detoxification that occur that take us from those main estrogenic compounds all the way to the, to the metabolites that are ready to be excreted either through the urine or the GI tract. Um, and then lastly, we'll also take a look at receptor function. So looking at estrogen receptors one and two, um, why those are important to assess in, in particular in a couple of situations um, and, and tying everything together from going from production to metabolism all the way down to, you know, when those, when those estrogens and when those hormones are wanting to interact at the receptor level. So starting out with estrogen production, um, I'm not going to get uh, too much into a, a biochemistry um, lesson here. You know, I don't want to bore everyone too much, but I do want to review a little bit of what exactly these enzymes do and, and what they're converting in the body. Um, and then we'll get into more of the specifics around the SNPs and the uh, conditions that can be affected here. So two of the main enzymes we're going to look at when it comes to estrogen production today are CYP19, which is aromatase, uh, which is the main enzyme that's involved in converting uh, estrogen. Uh, testosterone to estradiol, uh, which is E2, and then androstenedione to estrone, which is E1, uh, estradiol being uh, one of the most potent estrogens. And then we'll also look at HSD17B1, uh, which stands for hydroxysteroid 17B dehydrogenase 1. I will call it the short name uh, to, to save a breath there, um, which is involved in the conversion of estrone to estradiol. Uh, estrone being a more weakly estrogenic hormone uh, converting to a more strong estradiol. And so with estrogen production, we always want to um, think about whether or not we're wanting to increase or decrease this, and it really largely depends on the clinical scenario. Um, a lot of times individuals, when they're using Opus Explorer, uh, or they're using, they're trying to analyze genetic information. They're not really sure, okay, do I want to be um, thinking about increasing the activity of these things or decreasing the activity of these things? And what it, re what it really comes down to is uh, the, the actual clinical scenario. So going back to that patient's chief complaint and going back to their family history. And so, for example, um, with estrogen production in particular, so looking at aromatase and uh, HSD17B1, um, two situations in which we'd want to, you know, try to increase the estrogen production uh, would be when it, someone's, you know, going through menopause, so they're experiencing a lot of those menopausal symptoms, so you can try to give them relief from a genomics pe perspective um, by trying to upregulate the endogenous production of estrogens, um, because they'll still, even though the ovaries really do decrease their production of estrogen during menopause and perimenopause, you can also still get a significant production from the adrenal glands. Um, and then also when someone's got irregular menstrual cycles, uh, in particular when they have low, uh, low E, so low estradiol or low estrone during the follicular phase, um, a lot of times with irregular menses, you'll want to get some comprehensive um, cycle mapping done. Uh, to sort of tie in, you know, what exactly is going on. Sometimes it's a progesterone issue, so they're not um, fully ovulating, uh, or it's an estrogen uh, issue where they're not producing enough estrogen at the beginning of the cycle. And so in particular, when someone's got low E during the follicular phase, uh, which is that first uh, two weeks prior to ovulation, you'll want to work on increasing estrogens during this time period. And then in terms of when you'd want to reduce estrogen production, and this is when we, you know, a lot of times um, we're more focusing on this, this area here. So in particular with PCOS, 
um, uh, with estrogen dominance symptoms. So if any individuals with um, symptoms that oscillate after the start or after the end of their periods, um, heavy bleeding, heavy clotting during periods, things like that. It's a lot of estrogen dominance um, symptoms. And then also estrogen sensitive cancers. We'd obviously want to be reducing the endogenous estrogen production in the body, or at least working on making sure those, those aspects are being metabolized more um, cleanly, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so with the estrogen production here, so and throughout the presentation I've got, oops, sorry, let me go back here. Um, Throughout the presentation, you'll see on this map, I'm kind of circling the enzymes uh, that we're talking about. So right now we're focusing on aromatase, CYP19A1. Um, this is, like I said earlier, what we convert androstenedione and testosterone into estrone and estradiol. Um, the relevant SNPs you're gonna, gonna wanna be looking at are listed out here uh, to the left. So there's about five that can actually significantly impact the function of this gene. Um, and the, the genotype that's listed out beside those is the risk allele. So for example, with RS4646, um, TT is the risk, the homozygous risk allele that we're going to want to be looking at. Um, and so, you know, if you're checking these things on your own, that's, that's good information for you to have. But also during the live demo portion of this, I'll, I'll be sure to show where we can actually find that information in Opus, uh, Opus Explorer. Um, so those are the five SNPs there. Um, good strong, a good strong agonist of uh, estrogen production uh, for aromatase is actually uh, coleus forscoli. Uh, the, the constituent of that plant called forscolin is actually a strong agonist of aromatase. Um, and then antagonists, so these are, you know, generally speaking, we're, um, you, you'll recognize a lot of these in terms of sort of aromatase inhibitors uh, from the natural side of things that are commonly used. So things like chrysin, zinc, selenium, flaxseed, nettles, EGCG, which comes from uh, green tea, and then proanthocyanidins, which comes from um, things like elderberry and, and all those berries. That's what gives them that, that rich, dark uh, blue and purple color. Um, so in, in terms of agonists and antagonists, you have those there. And so, and then going back to when we want to upregulate these things, that would be uh, when you're wanting to use agonists. And then when you're wanting to downregulate or reduce the production of estrogens, uh, that would be, be when we use antagonists. Um, and once again, and so all of this information, a lot of it, and I'll show it once uh, when we're going through Opus Explorer, um, all this information sort of tabulated there. And so we can get kind of an in-depth look by kind of focusing in here, but then I'll also show how we dig through the program and find it later on. So the next enzyme we'll talk about is HSD17B1. Um, so this is, whereas aromatase is involved in the conversion of testosterones to estrogens uh, or androgens to, to estrogens, uh, now we're looking at more of the conversion of a, a weaker estrogenic substance, which is estrone, and converting that over to estradiol, which is a very strongly estrogenic uh, hormone. Um, there's two main relevant SNPs that we'd want to focus on with HSD17B1, um, and you can see the risk alleles there once again. And actually another strong agonist of HSD17 uh, is forscolin from coleus forscoli. Uh, and then DHEA is another good one too. So you, it can actually upregulate the, uh, providing DHEA to someone can actually upregulate that conversion to estrone, to, uh, from estrone to estradiol. And then slowing down this conversion, so the antagonists here. So uh, a, uh, a plant that's not commonly used or thought of for this is actually called gossypium, uh, which is the cotton plant. And the constituent from that is called gossypol uh, that actually does that. And then giving phytoestrogens and providing those uh, actually does slow down this conversion, which, which makes sense um, from just sort of a logical perspective. So phytoestrogens come from things like flax, uh, soy isoflavones, um, even plants like hops or avena have some phytoestrogens in there. Uh, so you can provi provide those things. Um, and then also licorice is another one that slows down this conversion of estrone to estradiol. 
And so when you'd want to slow down this conversion is when someone's showing up. And once again, these can be checked with functional labs, or you can also look at um, even regular lab markers through a place like Quest or LabCorp. You can get total counts of estrone and estradiol from them, um, even if you're not wanting to go the functional lab routes with, with Dutch, for example. Um, and so if someone's coming up with elevated estradiol and they have a lot of those estrogen dominant symptoms, um, you can certainly you know, pull in some of these antagonists to uh, s slow down that conversion of estrone to estradiol. Okay, so moving from the production side uh, over to the metabolism and detox side, uh, there's a couple of different um, phases of detoxification here. And the lines do become a little bit blurred between phase one and phase two detox when it comes to estrogens. Um, but, you know, kind of uh, strictly thinking of the cytochromes as uh, your phase one, there's three main ones that we want to focus on when it comes to uh, estrogen metabolism and detox. So that would be cytochrome 1A1, 1B1, and 3A4. And there's, so these are the the three main ones. Now, a lot of different cytochromes do play a role in this, so it's not strictly that these go down this pathway only. Um, there's many different enzymes in the cytochrome group. However, these are the major ones that we can generally see a genomic aspect to, um, and the, the major players really in terms of the conversion of these hormones. And so 1A1 is, generally speaking, the one the uh, the CYP enzyme that we want to be shunting the majority of our estrone and estradiol metabolism through. Uh, when when estrone, or, so I'll just call them E1 and E2 for now, just to sh sh shorten it up a little bit. So E1 and E2, uh, when they're converted through the CYP1A1 enzyme, they head down towards the 2-hydroxy estrone and estradiol pathway, uh, which is much more protective. So it's uh, the 2-hydroxy version of those hormones is, is more protective in terms of um, lower risk of uh, lower long-term risk of estrogen related cancers uh, estrogen related cardiovascular disease and things along those lines. Um, when we start pushing those when we start pushing E1 and E2 down the CYP1B1 pathway and the CYP3A4 pathway, so those are the second ones on there, uh, we actually start to see, um, especially with the 4-hydroxy the version there, there is an, a little bit of an increased risk of estrogen-related cancers um, because 4-hydroxy estrone and estradiol are, are more potent estrogens than the 2-hydroxy version. Um, and then also with uh, the... Um, 3A4 version, so looking at the 16 hydroxy estrone and estradiol, uh, those are that one is significantly estrogenic. So once again, we see more long-term consequences, um, not necessarily related to estrogen-related cancers, but if someone's experiencing a lot of the experiencing a lot of those estrogen dominant symptoms, or someone with PCOS will be pushing a lot of um, their estrogen conversions down this path pathway. And so you really want to clean up this metabolism by mainly pushing them towards that CYP1A1 pr uh, pathway. Um, and the clinical significance here, so when someone comes to you, you know, maybe they have uh, currently have PCOS or they have irregular menses. Um, when you're going through their family history uh, or even their personal history, they might have a history of estrogen sensitive cancers. So that can be ovarian cancer, breast cancer, um, even, even sometimes... Uh, even the uh, more female hormonal um, cancers like uterine cancer or cervical cancer can be related to that. Uh, and then also, like we talked about, signs of estrogen dominance as well as PCOS. So thinking about, um, and you'll see where we're at on the pathway now with those red circles around the cytochromes there, um, thinking about which way we want to push these things. So we want them going down. We want the estrogens, whether it's estrone or estradiol, we want it to be going down that 1A1 protective pathway. And with each one of these cytochromes, there's many SNPs that are, uh, that, that are considered to be um, clinically relevant. And we'll go through those when I switch over to live demo in a little bit. But since we're wanting to push things down the 1A1 pathway, we would want to use agonists against uh, for 1A1, agonists being that they upregulate the activity there. So things like cruciferous vegetables, uh, DIM and I3C, uh, berries, most likely because of the uh, proanthocyanidins there, 
uh, Kava Kava, EGCG, and soy are all agonists of that CYP1A1 enzyme. So those are those are all good options there. Um, and then with the CYP1B1 and the CYP3A4, the ones that are related to um, estrogen-related cancers or have a strong estrogenic activity, um, we want to use antagonists in those situations because we want to be shunting the metabolism up towards that 1A1. And so you'll see with 1B1, uh, you, we've got resveratrol, hops, uh, flavonoids. Um, so those can come from things like rutin or hesperidin. Uh, grapefruit is another antagonist of 1B1 um, and then quercetin. Uh, and then with CYP3A4, we also see antagonists of that enzyme being resveratrol, once again, quercetin, uh, soy isoflavones, grapefruit, uh, nani juice, and then valerian are also strong antagonists. Um, not surprising to see grapefruit show up as um, strong antagonists of the, some of these cytochromes being that, you know, even when someone's taking birth control, for example, grapefruit can be interactive with that. And so that's really where these, um, these tie in is how uh, things like grapefruit or even cranberry juice uh, in some situations can interact with these cytochromes. So moving on to the phase two of detoxification. Um, so like I was saying, there is there is a little bit of a blurred line between with estrogen metabolism in terms of what's phase one versus phase two because sometimes sulfation occurs even uh, prior to um, things going through cytochromes, but for our purposes, we'll keep these grouped as a phase two. Um, with sulfation, there's three enzymes here, um, and they're all sulfotransferases. So what these do is they transfer a, uh, a sulfohydryl group over from to a, from an, uh, they transfer a sulfohydryl group uh, to either estrone or estradiol. Uh, glucuronidation, so these um, glucuronic acid transferases, transfer glucuronic acid onto an estrogen. And then lastly, methylation, we'll talk about COMT. Um, especially with methylation, you know, we could go into an entire talk here about also how MTHFR and, and CBS mutations can play a role. Um, for our purposes to just kind of keep the scope of this presentation specifically on the estrogen genomics, um, I, I figured we'd save the the other methylation pieces for another day. Maybe we'll do another webinar in the future on those, but we will talk about COMT because that is one of the major ones involved in estrogen methylation. And then once again, um, areas where we want to start focusing on these things is when someone's coming in with personal or family history of these estrogen sensitive cancers, signs of estrogen dominance um, over progesterone or PCOS. So with the sulfation, you'll see on the pathway over here to the right. So estrone and estradiol can can actually go straight from um, the hormone, the, the actual active hormone, uh, through sulfation pathways. So they don't necessarily have to go through a cytochrome first. Um, we talk uh, 1A1, 2A1, and then 1A3 are generally speaking our most um, most relevant sulf uh, sulfotransferase enzymes. Um, but you'll see that there's other ones listed on here. Um, and then just to back things up for a second, I probably should have explained this at the start. On these pathways over here to the right, when you see, um, you'll notice that some of these enzymes are colored in uh, based on, uh, you, you see some oranges, some grays, yellows. Uh, within Opus Explorer, it's actually actively overlaying a client's genetics onto the enzyme pathways. Um, so you're actually seeing, like for example, with these sulfation, these sulfotransferase enzymes, um, that SALT1A1, and then down at the bottom of that circle, SALT16B1, actually have um, heterozygous and homozygous mutations present. Or as, for example, SALT2A1 doesn't have any uh, mutations present at all. So without, with, uh, throughout OPUS, when you see orange, that indicates that there's homozygous mutations present. Yellow means that there's heterozygous mutations present. And then gray means that uh, there, there's uh, it's normal wild type, so no um, no mutations or or SNPs present. Um, so as I was saying, sulfotransferases uh, transfer a sulfur group to molecules. So this doesn't only occur with estrogens; it occurs with a lot of other things in the body too. Um, but what what that transfer of sulfur does is it allows for phase two elimination of estrone and estradiol. So whether or not that's that's um, pushing it out through the uh, eventually through the um, urinary tract or through the GI tract. Um, this allows for eventual elimination. 
Um, and for every one of these genes, so for 1A1, 2A1, and then 1A3, uh, there's many relevant SNPs for each one of these. And so I'll, I'll show that during the demo portion. Um, just as an aside, so any individual who comes, uh, when, you, when you run this study on them and it shows that they have some dampered uh, sulfotransferase activity, uh, you can actually, without even considering um, trying to upregulate or downregulate the activity of these genes, you can actually provide sulfur groups as a means to enhance the transfer of sulfur. So by providing that raw substrate that sulfotransferase sulfotransferases need, which are sulfur groups, um, you can actually improve the function of these things without even going down to the genomic level. So foods that are rich in sulfur, things like onions, garlics, leeks, uh, cruciferous vegetables, organ meats, all of these things that are rich in sulfur can actually enhance the, um, the functionality of those enzymes. But then if you want to go one step further and you actually see that they do have some genomic hiccups, uh, in, in the forms of homozygous mutations on these things. Um, a couple of things that are shown to actually upregulate the activity of them are caloric restriction. So you can get someone um, doing something like intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, or even have them do a, um, a, a caloric mimicking or a fasting mimicking diet, for example. Um, or you can use hydroxy B12. So that's one particular form of B12, which um, you know, most people are familiar with either methylcobalamin or cyanocobalamin, but there's actually a hydroxy B12, which you can use. Uh, and then also ginsenosides from uh, Panax ginseng are also helpful here. And then antagonists of this. So if you're wanting to actually slow down um, the sulfation of estrogens, so whether it's estrone or estradiol, uh, you can actually give things like quercetin or T catechins, um, so those would be catechins from either black tea or green tea, uh, flavonoids or genistein diazine, which are uh, the activated products of soy isoflavones. Uh, you can actually give these things to actually slow down the, the sulf sulfotransferase activity, um, which you might want to do in particular situations when someone has low estrogen or they're, they're not um, pushing things down the right pathway. Uh, glucuronidation. So, glucuronidation is another step which can actually inactivate um, either 4-hydroxy estradiol or estradiol directly. Uh, when you add a glucuronic acid group onto something, um, whether it's a hormone or a toxin in the body or something, it, it works to inactivate it. And so, it allows it once again to be excreted through the urine or the GI tract. However, um, there are certain gut bacteria or even certain tissues in the body that can actually remove that glucuronic acid um, group and reactivate the estrogen or the, um, the estrogen uh, metabolic product. So you can actually add one of these glucuronic acid groups onto a piece, uh, onto a 4-hydroxy estradiol, so one of those very strongly um, potent estrogens and, and uh, to, to inactivate it, but then once it gets excreted into the GI tract, that can actually be deglucuronidated by your gut bacteria. Um, so how you prevent that is you can actually give good agonists um, directly of these UGT enzymes. So that would be calcium deglucurate, dandelion, ginger, chrysin, or D-limonene. Uh, and, and as a kind of thinking back to the sulf sulfotransferases, uh, when you give someone calcium deglucurate, not only does it actually improve the, the actual function of these genes and enzymes, but it's also providing the raw substrate for them. So it's providing uh, from that calcium deglucurate, it's providing the glucuronic acid groups that can be actually directly stuck onto those, um, those potent estrogens. Uh, and then antagonists, antagonists of these again, so once uh, quercetin shows up again, milk thistle, um, or you can you can either use milk thistle or you can use the extract called silly marin, uh, and then also licorice um, can be used to to slow down this glucuronidation activity. And then with uh, COMT, so you know I mentioned with methylation especially, there's 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 a lot of information here, um, and we could we can certainly do a deep dive on this in the future. Uh, however, for the estrogen detoxification in particular, the main one we want to pay attention to is COMT, which um, a lot of individuals will think of this more with in relation to the um, 
inactivation of norepinephrine and epinephrine, uh, for example. So when people come in with anxiety, they think of, okay, maybe there's some, some issues with COMT activity, but it also can be actually a big player in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the methylation of uh, 2-hydroxyestradiol and 4-hydroxyestradiol, uh, which further um, allows for the further detoxification of those. And it's a really important last step for removing those carcinogenic estrogen metabolites. Um, so some of the main uh, SNPs for COMT are the RS4633, uh, 4680, and then 4818. Um, you'll see there that the... Uh, I, I believe 4680 is that Valmet um, tran, um, uh, SNP, um, but uh, so those are the, really the three main players. However, th there are a lot of SNPs with COMT, but there's really only three main ones that actually do have a, a detrimental effect on the function of that enzyme. Um, strong agonists of COMT, so we see that uh, magnesium, um, that's a, a really tried and true one is magnesium, and especially people will notice that if they have anxiety, for example, um, a lot of the calming effects of magnesium are transmitted through this through this upregulation of magne uh, of um, COMT, but also 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, uh, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is vitamin B6, um, and then also providing things like methyl donors. So going back to this this idea that you can provide the um, the raw substrate that the uh, enzyme needs. So COMT stands for catechol O methyl transferase, so it's transferring a methyl group. So if you provide someone with the methyl groups, it'll it'll actually enhance the functionality here. And so you can provide those methyl donors in the forms of uh, SAMI. Um, however, some people don't tolerate SAMI very well, depending on their function of MTHFR or uh, CBS mutation. So you can also use things like trimethylglycine, which is what TMG stands for, uh, or dimethylglycine is another form of that and then methionine too. And then uh, some stronger antagonists of COMT activity uh, would be EGCG, um, cannabis sativa, and then rhodiola uh, rosea. Uh, those are all um, some strong antagonists of COMT activity. And then sort of the last piece here in terms of this estrogen pathway. So, you know, we went through the actual um, conversion of testosterone and androstenedione to, to uh, estrone and estradiol, uh, then the detoxification through the cytochromes, through sulfation, through glucuronic acid, and COMT. And then lastly, we get to where these estrogens are actually acting at the tissues. So on the pathway here, it only shows that estradiol is pointing, um, pointing towards these uh, these ESR receptors, estrogen receptors one and two. However, all of the estrogens do play a role here. And so estrone uh, does still interact with these ESR receptors uh, and all of the, um, especially the 4-hydroxyestradiol, which is the most potent and estrogenic of the, um, uh, of the estrogen metabolites. And then the 16-hydroxyestradiol, um, another one of those potent estrogen metabolites, they still all interact at these receptors. Um, and, and what these receptors are important for, important for are things like sexual development, reproductive function, uh, bone metabolism, migraines, um, especially with the reproductive function here. So infertility can be a big piece with this. Um, so you always be, want to be checking the status of the receptors when someone's coming in with a chief complaint of infertility, for example. Um, and then importantly, so while these um, vitamin A and vitamin D don't necessarily have a, a a specific role in terms of upregulating or downregulating the receptor. However, they are cofactors for the uh, estrogen receptors, specifically ESR1. And so, when someone is vitamin D deficient, uh, or 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 possibly vitamin A deficient via this retinoic acid uh, receptor, you do see that the estrogen receptors do begin to work um, a, a little bit more poorly. Um, so it's very important that, especially with vitamin D and its relation, you know, to, to so many different conditions, whether it's hormonal or cancer related or whatnot, that we, that people's levels are adequate because you're not going to get full uh, and adequate function of these receptors without them having uh, translocation of these uh, of VDR and retinoic acid to the nucleus when the estrogen receptor is heading to the nucleus as well. Um, so relevant SNPs with uh, 
ESR1. So I've got four listed out there. Um, there's many different ones that we check though, um, but those are really the four main relevant ones in terms of research uh, showing that they're, they have an effect on the gene. And then also uh, with the ESR2, there's one main SNP um, that is shown to have an effect. And then uh, as, as you would expect, so a, a good strong agonist uh, or upregulator of, of these ESR, of these estrogen receptors are things like genistine, exercise, Google, uh, Dioscorea, rhizome. Um, so that's the root of that plant. Um, and then antagonists uh, would be melatonin and gossypol, uh, gossypol being that constituent of the cottonseed plant. And so a couple of times throughout this presentation, I've mentioned Opus Explorer, and, and that's where that map is coming from that we've been looking at in, in this entire time. And so, you know, going back to the start, you know, I love tying this, especially these pathways into not only what's going on with their genomics, but also with lab findings. So if you're running a Dutch on someone, um, or if you're running, you know, just regular markers through Quest or LabCorp, um, you're not necessarily gonna be able to put those those lab markers into Opus Explorer, but what you can do is use Opus Explorer to tie things in there. And so really what I find is that you're giving people really the best outcomes when you can look at the genomics in addition to the lab findings. Um, and so what Opus Explorer does is it, it's, a, it's essentially a tool to analyze the data from uh, the DSL genomic insight test. Um, and within Opus Explorer, there's actually multiple different analytic applications rolled into a single program. And all of those applications use visual informatics to present complex complex information in a user-friendly way. So thinking back to that map um, that we're, we were showing, you know, there's a lot of data com contained within that one picture. And so we'll show how you can actually explore that and how it's, it's sort of driving your attention to the most relevant pieces. Um, and, you know, very importantly, especially with genomic and genetic information, it's, it's it needs to be backed up by some evidence. So we need to make sure that we're paying attention to the SNPs that actually do have a role in terms of the function of these, uh, in the function of the genes, because a lot of SNPs, there's not really a clear relationship that, okay, when someone has the SNP present, the, the gene activity is influenced. They're not, you know, they're not as robust as, for example, with the MTHFR SNPs, you know, it's night and day in terms of the function. Um, some SNPs really don't have that much of an effect. And then lastly, it's, it's a great tool that we can use to engage your patients and clients um, and create reports for them and give them actionable data um, in terms of supplements and herbs and nutrients and, and diet and lifestyle changes. Um, within Opus, and I'll go through this during the, the live demo portion here at the end, um, within Opus we have two main pieces, uh, two, two main ways that you can curate data. Uh, one is through using a report wizard which is what we would, what what I call quote unquote like basic use, um, and then you can actually use the curation editor, which is a more advanced use. So with the report wizard, uh, you can quickly and easily generate a report of all of this estrogen um, estrogen related data. So what what Opus will do is go through all of those genes that are on that map, for example, and then pull out the ones that the client actually has um, a relevant genetic um, you know, SNPs present and put those into a report for you so that you can discuss those things. Um, and it'll keep it relatively general, so it won't give you all of the different supplement recommendations, things like that, but it at least compiles all the information very quickly so you can get an idea of what exactly is going on. And then with the curation editor, you can actually comb through the genes and the pathways individually and add things to a, a report that you custom build yourself um, and it's fully customizable. And so this is what the report wizard looks like. So you can see over here on the um, on the left side, we have all these different categories and I have the estrogen genomics box ticked. So we'll see what a report looks like when we're actually um, going through that. And then you can also include to uh, show the estrogen on the, on the right side here. Now you can actually include to show the network maps, um, the introductory explanatory test uh, text, you can show non-risk SNPs, um, high value agents, possible drug interactions, and then also if you want to tie in um, particular product recommendations, you can too. So with, um, with you know, using the, the advanced curation editor, um, like I was saying, you can really create a highly individualized report for someone. 
and develop those reports uh, and focus those in different areas. And so you can actually generate different reports. So say, you know, you want to work on estrogen genomics with someone one day, but they also have a chief complaint of anxiety or they also have a chief complaint of, you know, any number one of, of those other categories from before. Um, you can develop a, a report for them based on anxiety, or you can develop a report for them based on inflammation. Um, and, but, you know, in terms of developing these things, you always want to keep the big picture in mind. So always let their chief complaint be driving what you're developing the report for. So there's obviously a lot of information contained within Opus. Um, so you want to keep it as specific as possible so that people don't get lost in the weeds. Um, and then always remember that, so no matter what application you're in with it, with the Opus, uh, it's always feeding data to that curation editor. So if you add a gene in from the maps, you can be sure that it's going to show up in your editor later. And then use it as a teacher too. So uh, as you become more familiar with the gene, you'll actually you know, be, you, you'll be learning about these things yourself um, just from, from using the program. So I'm going to switch us over to a, uh, a demonstration now of Opus um, where I'm actually going to walk us through this path, this pathway and show you actually how we come up with all the data. So give me just one second here while I switch over to my Chrome browser. Okay, so you should be able to see uh, my browser now. Uh, and what we're looking at is this map that we, we were looking at the entire time. Um, so we started here, um, and right now I have a, a dummy client uh, uploaded by the name of Venus Demilo. Um, and what we're looking at is this actual pathway that we were, we were sort of walking through that entire process. Uh, during that entire presentation. So you can see here all those enzymes that we talked about, HSD17B1, aromatase, all the sulfation enzymes, all those glucuronidation enzymes, um, the CO, uh, COMT, and then also the estrogen receptors. So when you're, when you're using Opus, um, I really in particular like using the MAPS. Um, we not only have MAPS for estrogen metabolism, but also many other different biochemical pathways, but we'll focus on this one since that's the purpose of today's presentation. But so for example, let's say we want to investigate, and as you can see here, we've got some homozygous SNPs present on aromatase, and we know that because we see this orange color here, which represents that, they, that there's some homozygous SNPs present. Um, when you click on the gene itself, it brings you to this gene pop-up page, which gives you a, um, and the layout for these is the exact same for every gene. So they're kind of, um, and the, the way that Dr. Diodamo always explained it is that they're kind of like baseball cards. So you, you, always, you constantly, you know, they've got the stats, they've got an explanation here. They're always, um, they're pr providing you information. So you get very familiar with them over time. Um, you see here, you have a, uh, a description of the gene. And then you also, so this is a, a sort of a high level description that a provider would understand some, you know, someone who's actually analyzing the data understands. But when you, let's say you wanna add this gene to a patient report and you click this button here, it's not gonna give the patient this long explanation of what COMT or of what CYP19A1 is um, that they're not gonna understand. It actually puts together a simplified description for them so that they actually know why you added this into their report. Um, and then, you know, similar to some of, uh, you, you'll see a table here that lists out all the relevant SNPs. So um, it, it's, it lists out every SNP that we're tracking for, uh, for aromatase, but it also gives you what the interest allele is. So that would be the risk allele and then whether or not they're homozygous or heterozygous for that. Um, and you can see that there's also a power factor associated with these, uh, with every one of these different SNPs. What the power factor represents is how much this how much this SNP actually matters. So how much research is there actually showing that this SNP actually has anything to do with the function of this gene? So now you know, you know, instantaneously that, you know, for example, this SNP that this individual has a homozygous mutation on has a high a, a decently high level of power factor that it actually has some effect on the gene. Whereas if they had a homozygous SNP on one of these other ones that has a much lower power factor, it might not necessarily be as important. Um, it also links, links out uh, diseases that have been associated with aromatase. Uh, so, and then uh, lastly, some of the agents. So I listed out some of the main agents uh, during, during the presentation, but as you can see, there's actually a lot more than what I put on there. Um, 
and the relative size of these bars once again is how robust the evidence is uh, and if you see green that means that it's an agonist of of CYP19A1 or, or aromatase or when you see an orange bar it means it's an antagonist um, and you know if you want to actually dig further so everything that's on this what we call fingerprint pattern um, you can actually scroll down and you'll actually see uh, they're all listed here in a table form and all of the PubMed studies that actually show that hey chrysin actually does have an antagonistic effect on uh, on aromatase, um, all the PubMed studies are always linked right here. So you can actually click these right here and go straight to that PubMed study, which shows that. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, when we're looking at these pathways, you want to get a global sense. Um, you know, I mentioned with, especially like the sulfation enzymes, for example, the, some of the, the major more important ones, um, there's a lot of relevant SNPs, right? So, you, you know, there's sometimes there's 10 up to 15, but you just want to get an idea from looking at these things. Okay, so we see right here, obviously there's some heterozygous mutations present on SALT1A1, so that might be an area for us to investigate. Or if we wanted to look at COIP1A1, um, you know, you can see there's some homozygous mutations there. And so that's what I kind of mean when I talk about that the, the program really tries to drive your attention to the most relevant areas, whereas, you know, this is clearly a much more um, relevant place to look versus CYP1A2. You know, they don't have any uh, SNPs present there. Um, and so, and then just for kind of continuity purposes, um, I'll, I'll show you on here. So, for example, the SALT1A1, um, it's that same exact layout with the explanation here, um, the simplified client description. Um, I personally, you know, sometimes I, I actually get a lot more out of the client mutation than these long ones too. So, you know, sometimes these can even uh, help someone, uh, help help to understand them even better. Um, and then uh, the power factors here. So you can see a lot of these SNPs. Um, and then also, once again, the fingerprint pattern. So, you know, there's a lot more agents here than what we just have listed out in the PowerPoint. Um, and then... You know, if pathways or maps aren't really your thing, one area that you can also investigate uh, is the um, the syndrome templates. So the network maps, and I'll just show generally speaking here, are the 10 that are in Opus Explorer. Uh, so you have everything from adipocytokines, catecholamines, all the way down to phase one and phase two. Uh, obviously, we're just focusing on the estrogen today, which this is the, the map we were looking at, the estrogen metabolism in the liver. But you can also go to um, syndrome templates, which will show you, um, and if we scroll down, so once again, we're seeing a lot of the other categories here, but there's also a um, estrogen genomics category where it pulls in all of the relevant uh, genes that an individual um, that that has to do with estrogen genomics and then plots them once again on this fingerprint style pattern so that you can actually get an idea where this individual has the most um, the, the, the most uh, SNPs present so you're able to get a good idea here um, of uh, of which genes would be most important to explore and you'll recognize that a lot of these are the ones that come from those pathways so the sulfation enzymes the UGTs which are those glucuronidation enzymes and then the estrogen receptors too um, and so, you know, we see here that aromatase is an area to investigate with this individual. COMT would be an area to investigate. Um, it's pulling in MTHFR because of its importance with methylation. Um, and then also a couple of these cytochromes here. And you can also get to um, an, an individual explanation of all of these genes by using these boxes here. So with COMT, for example, it can actually show you all of the different um, the, re the relevant SNPs if you're wanting to look at them from a more um, individual perspective. And then the last piece I wanted to show before we get to, um, you know, so sort of what a report looks like based on the, the wizard um, are these multi-SNP macros. Um, we, gener we call these things uh, algorithms. And so what they're looking at is um, relating a SNP or, or genes on or, or SNPs on a, a couple of different genes uh, to a clinical scenario. And so we have a lot of different categories of these. Um, I'm just going to filter by the female ones for now. Um, so you can see here, we do have uh, some, a, a couple of related to the women's health here. So 
when they're false, that means that it wasn't true for that individual. And then when it says true here, that means that this this algorithm was true for this person. Um, so as you can see with this one, which is a 10 times higher risk of endometriosis, uh, 0.5 uh, times lower risk of endometrial cancer, and then 0.76 uh, times less uh, cognitive impairment. You can click on these things and then get an idea of what gene this actually has to do with. So this has to do with the ESR1 gene and this particular SNP on it. Um, and then you can investigate further, especially if, for example, someone is coming in with the endometriosis, uh, with endometriosis or endometrial cancer or something like that. Okay, so I just wanna show the wizard um, before we wrap up here. So this is uh, what you would actually send your client home with. So if, uh, for example, you're, you got a client coming in with, or a patient coming in with um, uh, either BPH, or they have, um, you know, an estrogen-related cancer, or they have PCOS, or they have, you know, really any of these things that are related to estrogen, you can use the wizard to just quickly develop a report for them. So let's say that we want to include the map. Um, we want to include the introductory explanatory text. Um, I don't really care about the non-risk SNPs right now, um, or the low-magnitude SNPs. Um, the... Uh, the, we'll go ahead and include the natural products as well as the um, the table and then the designs for health products. Uh, once we hit run this the wizard, what it does is it generates us a report. And so this is what you would either print out on paper for your patient or you can send it to them as a PDF. Um, it, it saves nicely or prints nicely either way. And then this is what you would actually walk through with them. So. Um, the beginning part is more uh, just general information about opus, um, what genetics are, what chromosomes are, what SNPs are, um, and gives them, you know, a, a, an introduction to these things because a lot of people haven't taken a genetics class uh, in, in recent history. Um, it gives them, you know, a little bit of a, a um, I don't want to say a disclaimer here, but a, a, uh, a, a gives them context around what this report is. So it doesn't mean that the, the world is ending tomorrow for them. All, what this is all about is risks, risks and probabilities and things like that. And then actually the report itself. So similar to how within Opus, we've got orange meaning homozygous SNPs, yellow meaning heterozygous SNPs. You'll also sometimes see green throughout the report. And that means uh, that the, uh, the green, there, there's SNPs present that actually confer a beneficial effect on the function of that gene uh, via a, a, you know, a beneficial a clinical outcome or a beneficial effect there. Um, so, you know, this is where it'll start getting more specific to the individual. So it'll print them out all of these, the genes that are most uh, relevant here in terms of estrogen genomics. Now, if we wanted to tailor this report to inflammation or if we wanted to tailor this report to um, you know, male genomic or uh, and androgen genomics, or if we wanted to, you know, any of those other categories, you can do those as well. Um, and then it'll pull out the most relevant genes. And so this is where the wizard is helpful because it'll generate a, um, a, a you know, a, a, a report for them that's quick, quickly done on your end. And then it also identifies the most relevant inter, uh, intervention spaces. So for example, in the individual we were saying earlier that aromatase was an important one. And so Opus immediately recognized that and pulls it into the report for you. Um, the And 1A1 once again was affected. And so you see throughout the report, it, it just kind of goes through and finds the most relevant information um, based on that. And so this is an example of what the report would look like if, uh, if you were using the wizard. Now, when you use the curation, um, aspect of the program, you're able to custom choose this. So let's say you only want to uh, talk about cytochrome 1A1 and you only want to talk about aromatase with this person, you can create a report that is uh, just specifically about those things. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, it's depending on where you want to go. So you can either use the curation editor, which um, when you choose genes throughout the report, um, they'll show up here. And so I from before I had pre-selected COMT and MAOA, um, even though MAOA doesn't have much, a ton to do with um, estrogen genomics, we, we have it in here. Um, 
and then you can actually choose what goes in the report based on what you've selected using the maps, what you've selected using the templates, um, what you've selected using the algorithms. All of that will show up here. So for example, if I go to the multi-SNP algorithms and I want to add in that one um, female algorithm, um, and then I click here, uh, and I add curate, now it'll show up on my curation editor as one of the ones that I wanted to add in. So now we see it here as one of the ones that you can show, uh, add into a custom report. So essentially with, with Opus, you can either use the wizard um, or you can use the, the custom uh, curated report as well. Um, and that's, uh, you know, pretty much all I had today to cover. So, you know, we started out very uh, specific in terms of talking about those individual genes and enzymes that are involved in the production of estrogens, the metabolism and detox of estrogens, and then lastly, the receptors um, that the estrogens pl uh, play with. Um, and then we, we kind of went over how you would actually pull those things together and put them together in a report for someone, um, as well as how to identify those uh, the, those specific um, genes and, and maps that are important. Um, and I, I believe, so at the end of this, if you do have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and send those over and we're gonna relay those to our customer support team and either myself or another one of the, the uh, medical advisors at DSL will, will get around and answering those when, when they need to. Um, so if you do have any specific questions, please feel free to send those along. We're happy to answer them um, as the week goes on. But other than that, um, that's about all for today. I hope you found it helpful in terms of estrogen genomics and um, see how that this can be a really useful to, tool in terms of um, enhancing your, your practice.